it's my first time. <laughs> okay. Um, well, Eric, since your idea is really what spawned this meeting, do you want to start us off? Sure, I can get us uh, rolling. And knowing that this is really a, a collective conversation, it was more of just like a, huh, I wonder. Not a, huh, I have the answer here. So, right, just to be very clear on that. But it was nice to feel the resonance with you patients on that. So, um, so yeah, just kind of stepping back, and I think we all know this, right? Like we're, um, Gabir has been working for a while on Medicare for a long time with many others, David, and uh, you know, a care team for some time. Um, and in particular, I think the pathway, at least when I was last involved and then COVID happened and life blew up and I just got sucked into many vortices that I won't bore any of you with, but, uh, we'll, we'll talk about, we can talk some other time about that. Last I had heard, so this is like three months ago, right? Like basically there was, we were working on developing a campaign to do uh, a, a crowdfunding campaign which could be used and, and had, uh, you know, has brought in uh, $40,000 or so for that, uh, which has given us a little more of a runway, which is great. Um, and then with that, also starting to work on advancing Medicare uh, and these other different resources and ideas that could be or has for bringing um, caring across, right? So, so with that, I, you know, I called Kabir and, I, and, and, you know, I got a note from him sort of asking for continued support and sort of moving forward with both supporting that campaign, but then also thinking about the, um, you know, moving forward with supporting his work on Medicare. And so, as I honestly, I, so I read that, I listened to some videos, I was kind of reading up on what's been happening in Kabir's life with his blog. So thank you for that, Kabir. It was great. It's lovely to have this digital medium um, to be able to kind of catch up. Um, so I, I'm not totally clueless. Um, and so, and, and, and basically as I was reading all of it and I was thinking about it, I was listening to it, the, the long and the short of it is, I, um, particularly also knowing I have a past history of like visiting before COVID and all this other stuff and sort of feeling the space and whatnot. Um, it just really kind of struck me of just sort of the, how wickedly hard it is to use words and language to convey this idea. In essence, it's like, it's a lived experience. It's something that I feel like you wanna, you, I think you had to just work through and experience to really understand. And, and I was just really getting hit by like, just sort of how the medium and the epistemology and the logic of words and language were just utterly failing uh, to kind of convey this. And so then when I thought about that, I was like, well, then how could you ever use words and language and use that as the pathway forward to invite people to s commit and support uh, Kabir's work? It didn't feel right. Um, to me, just based on what we're trying to offer, what I think Kabir and others are trying to offer into the world. So then I started thinking, well, okay, if that's the case, what is the right thing? And then I started really just thinking about the lived experience of Kabir and being around Kabir and caring for Kabir um, and, and really kind of flipping the narrative on its head from sort of the, I think what, what the healthcare model, which is anti, you know, kind of what we're fighting with Medicare, so it sets up this idea of caregiving as a chore, as a task, as a you know, as this thing that you you are you are professionalized to do, and not to negate that. Of course, there's a very important role of that, but also recognizing that caregiving can also be a life affirming activity. It can be something that it, it great, creates greater strength and and support for everyone who is doing it, and in particular, learning how to engage in that type of as. Kabir and, and others have framed Medicare um, is not going to be under is, is something that I think you would just need to live through and and I honestly started thinking about sort of like how Kabir as a sort of this ideal patient uh, for this in terms of both in terms of basically flipping his uh, quadriplegia and, and and the pains that he has actually into a, a, a strength because he's someone that both experiences it and so it's not like he's he's trying to like make the pain go away or make something bad you know not happen he, he can fully live it but he can also convey that through his actions his deeds his words his his ability to listen and empathize with someone while simultaneously experiencing his own self and it's like that's just something that i think could create a powerful understanding for anyone who is wants to really be caring for others in a way that I think is unique that you, you know, we just couldn't convey it through words. And also I thought like, well, that actually is a really powerful asset in terms of potentially building out a training model for those who are interested in care, particularly those who are coming back to the caring professions, recognizing that is that is our current structure. Like 
it seems like a pathway both for funding and for support to actually get built in the training model. And so in many ways, it was sort of flipping the idea on its head of saying Kabir's, um, you know, Kabir and, and all of that is wonderful about Kabir um, is actually the, like the thing that we want to build training around uh, and sort of like, again, it also then linking this to Apollo and whatnot, and I'll be quiet in a moment, almost done. Uh, it's, it's this idea of sort of recognizing that there is, there's a great deal of wisdom that exists in, you know, people who are formerly known as patients, right? I think when P Apollo, we were fr we've been framing and you guys have continued, I'm sorry, I haven't been fully connected around the patient experience of self-study and personal science and, you know, and knowing how to learn effectively, you know, um, and I guess I was just sort of taking that logic and extending it into the logic of caregiving. And in particular, sort of being someone that is so, that, I, that both needs care, but also can create a space of caring, Medicare, um, that just felt like a really powerful asset to kind of build around. And so that's just sort of the random thoughts that I had. Um, again, not that it's right, but more of a, huh, I wonder. So I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts and reactions to that and uh, reflections. Thank you, Eric. That's really an amazing vision. And um, let's just open it up. Thoughts, reactions, questions? Well, I'll jump in for a minute. Patients, welcome to knowing Eric. Um, <laughs> we have been blessed by Eric's um, wisdom, especially in the early days of founding Project Apollo. And so, Eric, it's just so refreshing because I love your, the way you think and the fact that, you know, you could just like outpour this amount of really useful thinking um, to get us started. Um, my, you know, when, when I read the original note and now when I'm hearing you say this, the idea of participating in the lived experience in Kabir's care community is, is really interesting. Um, and I, I, I think you're onto something, but I also think there are a lot of ways to do that. Yeah. And so I, I, I'm almost wondering, let's, let's make it as a given that this training will be experiential in some way and maybe look at from the caregiver's perspective, from Kabir's perspective, and Dennis as a caregiver has a rich perspective too. Um, how, how could we convey this training? In a, I mean, are we talking about making videos? Are we talking about in-person events? And, and of course, your idea of flipping the, let's pay to be Kabir's caregiver, which I love. I, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to take my cynical mind on that one because I think it's a really fascinating idea. Um, but so I, I think it's a matter of not whether we we should look at it that way, but what forms this experiential process could take that might be um, possible to do and also um, useful and 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 how can we create that experiential training? So that's, that's my two cents. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. I, the, the sound bath of listening to your mind again is just so refreshing. I've missed it. <laughs> and that <laughs> smile and, uh, and, and knowledge that uh, uh, I can just be around that kind of light. It's wonderful. Um, and, uh, I've been mulling over what this could mean because uh, my heart goes out to Kabir and uh, I want to sweep him up and take care of him because I love him and it just activates all of my caregiver nature, which is always uh, kind of in flux. So I started thinking about this idea of um, taking this to the real. I've hired some caregivers for Janice. And 
every one of them that I've worked with has been an interesting person. Most have been the products of tough experience that they're standing up under and they're disenfranchised. They're working hand to mouth. They're trying to take care of themselves and families. It's, it's, and they're, they're so undervalued. Um, and I wanted to bring them into our life to, to give me the time to work, but also to support Janice. And, and it really comes down to being able to pay these people a wage that can attract them and keep them. And uh, so I'm thinking, what would that be? And I'm getting very practical here. I think bottom line to get the people to come and work, you've got to pay them about $25 an hour. And what the market seems to be providing is $15 an hour. So I've paid people 17, 20 and $25 an hour. And each time um, that number goes up, the quality of the relationship improves. So there's just that sort of hardcore financial reality that we're asking people to give a lot for relatively a little. And so how do you, how do, how do we do that and, and make this work? Now I've been also involved in the crowdsourcing and it struck me just as we were, were talking today that if we could describe the exper experiential training in a way that would attract interns, then the crowdsourcing could become about creating scholarships that would pay those interns the $25 an hour to attract them to the training. And that when you look at the fundraiser, I look at Kabir's face, I know Kabir, I, my heart goes out. I try to project that into the rest of the, the viral stream. But if a donor were able to look and see, well, this would provide this, it would be tangible. And that $25 an hour would be significantly more than typically Kabir could pay for help. And it would begin to magnetize in people because the word scholarship and interns that appeals to students it appeals to sinkers it, it's it's something that has status to it and it's a resume builder right so you you, you once we kind of encapsulize what the training would be part of that would be you're building your healthcare caretaker resume part of it would be um you have a certificate of Medicare training. Part of it would be this way of arming a person who wants to go into this workplace so that they can make a little better living. And, and $25 an hour is a start. It's a good start. So that all is just sort of cascaded in in the last half an hour. I've been reading the Trello boards. I've been sort of like always, you know, paddling furiously <laughs> to try to get my head above the, 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 the swamp of ideas I'm thinking about. But this is such an elevating thing to work with. It's such a, it's such a oh, bright, bright light. And that's what I could make out of your, uh, your, your written piece, Eric, was this, how could this be? And then suddenly it seems to me this is how it could be. In, in a real kind of nitty gritty, useful, quick to um, get out their way. So that's what I have. I love the practicality of it, Dennis, and the doability of it. That you, you, it's like, whoa, that may be something we can do. Huh, thanks. That's, that's brilliant, actually. Does that, that soothe your cynical mind, Tyler? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it does. Seriously, because I've been, I've been, thinking, you know, since, since Eric wrote his, his note about um, how, how, how could this be done? You know, cause that's where I always go. I go to execution first. That's um, why I asked Leslie Tyler. Cause I was like, Oh God, I got a little bit crazy. I don't know how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But I always go to execution first and, and I've been sort of, you know, wandering around in, in that cloud for 24 hours and, and bingo, Dennis, from your experience, um, 
I think that's a, I mean, really, and, and I, I do a lot with scholarships. I'm, I, I, I'm on a scholarship committee to give scholarships to certain underprivileged young people who are going through a four year college thing. And so I have, when you say scholarships to people wanting to enter that field, I have this amazing picture of the quality of human beings that I've had the privilege to support over about the last 15 years and what they've gone on to do. Um, and so, and, and how, it, how, it, how it is heartfelt that, that these people, and they're not always young, sometimes they're, they're further along in their lives, but they're looking to further their education. And um, the, the, just the giving of the scholarship makes such a huge difference um, in their lives and, and combine that with the ability to maybe source a career in, in, a, in a higher quality level of caregiving um, and take care of their families or their personal needs uh, at, a, at a, you know, I, I just think that's brilliant. And by the way, Roger's doing stuff on a ladder right behind me, so don't be distracted. <laughs> My perpetual motion has been, I'm not, I don't, I don't look. Anyway, I'll, I'll go back to video, but, but Dennis, I think, thank you for zooming in on something that can be done. Yeah. Patience, Kabir, I'd love to hear your thoughts before we process towards action. Yeah, Patience, do you wanna jump in or? Um, I'm furiously scribbling down notes right now. Um, the certificate of Medicare training, Dennis, that was um, that particularly stood out for me. And um, the thought I had while you were speaking, Eric, is that if we could somehow offer CEUs, continuing education units for healthcare practitioners. Um, and maybe like, um, a, I don't know if that would be a, a, a workshop or an ongoing uh, training of successive uh, educational pods mixed in with caregiving. Um, I have no idea how that would come about, but that's what popped into my mind. And uh, really, why well, just got what we're doing is we're we're elevating the field of care for the caregiver for the one receiving care and for the world and i i'm 100 percent certain that we've spoken about this and i probably read it or heard it in other recorded zoom conversations with other people but it just it just hit me like that is that's valuable that's that's the offering you know, and, and I started my career in alternative health and medicine in 1999 as a massage therapist with 200 hours, which for me, it was a way to make a living as a single mom. But when I shifted my view from this is how I make money to this is healing for me, for the people I serve and for the people around us. My business took off exponentially and I was able to, to take that into like more education for myself and different career fields. And um, when you had mentioned Dennis, like, the, the people who come into the field of caregiving, typically having life experiences and being, um, you know, disenfranchised, I think is the word that you use. Um, we're, we're elevating what it is to be a caregiver. We're creating a completely different experience around um, the relationship that has typically been the relationship between caregiver and patient or caregiver and the one receiving care to something more sacred. Well said. Should 
appear, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Just floored right now. Just to, um, Dennis, I came up with the exact same number, $25 an hour. Bradford just moved in down the hall. I think tonight will be his first night sleeping here. He's a 27 year old basketball player who uh, had an aunt and a grandfather who were paraplegic and quadriplegic and responded to our ad and uh, then almost squeezed out the back end. Like it's just, it's been insane. Like it, every attempt at hiring a caregiver has had some magical, complete rug out from under an experience. Like just how is this so consistently not happening? It's just been flabbergasting. And when Le Bradford called on the Sunday night before starting training on Monday and said, yeah, the living arrangement I had isn't going to work out. So I have to move back to Temecula with my folks so we can't, can't do this. I just said, no, <laughs> this pattern breaks here. And, um, and so he's moving in down the hall. And one of the things that that precipitated was a frame that he's actually on a two month intensive here. So I actually have a curriculum of three books that he's going to be reading and discussing with me in this context. And we're going to be looking at different aspects of his health and well-being and self-care. And it's, it's explicitly framed as a two month intensive of personal development that will at the very least make him a better basketball player and point guard. And um, his heart is wide open to like wherever this leads. But I'm just like so astonished that we literally have this frame around a training program. And two days later, Eric calls, calls in and says, hey, what if we make it a training program? And then we initiate this conversation and Dennis says, what if we pay him $25? Like, in my mind, my excited mind, Eric and I share that, that kind of pie in the sky aspirational quality of like, yeah, let's have people pay to come and care for me. That sounds great. And, you know, I've been, in the back of my mind, I've got enough Tyler in the room saying like, how's that going to work? How do we, where do we find these people with money and how do we convince them? And, and this, this Dennis just bringing it right back home to where I was six months ago, like, well, for fuck's sake, what's the actual what does it cost for a human being to be a human being in San Diego? And how do we honor that? Because anything short of that is not Medicare. Yeah. You know, it's just more of this extortion. And so, and that's been the other piece that I've been thinking about, Eric, since you brought this up is like, how do we frame a, a program? Like, how do we, how do we tell somebody here's the here's the syllabus of what we're gonna do together? And at the same time, it is organic, it is lived. I just had a a man come in last night from the agency. And God, I'm so like blessed to be having this experience again and again and again right now. Again, a guy comes in from the agency, clearly some professional skills. Um, not I wouldn't call him withdrawn but certainly not forthcoming about, hi, I'm Clifford and this is my life, you know? But I just poked just enough and a little bit. And it turns out he's a born again Christian since the 1970s in, uh, in Pasadena. And he was, so like he came to life when I invited him to share his testimony with me. And it led us into this place of dialogue and prayer and, and his heart 
so open and, and playing lightly with the terms like Sufi, you know, shit that like born again Christians just like, well, I'm sure that's just the devil's words cloaked in something else, you know. But like he's like, by the end of the evening, he's joking about the term Sufi and, and actually saying like, I didn't know what to expect when I got here, but I didn't know you two hours ago and I love you now, he says, as he's giving me a hug, you know. And so, you know, when I think of the audience for these scholarships and the people that might come forward and want to fund these scholarships, the audience isn't just the underserved caregivers, but it's people in administrative roles at UCSD and it, at doctors in clinics. It's, it's all kinds of people many of whom are un underemployed during COVID right now in a, in a fairly secure and cloistered environment to come and do work, but to also co-generate care wisdom in a cohort process and take that back out into the field in multiple facets. I'm really, I've got Dave Ford in my head as well that like, if we're not doing this for the commons, what are we doing it for? And so how do we, generate a program that 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 seeds more similar prototypical practice in the wider San Diego health community to really start to yeah let this be a special place of Medicare. Hey Mike, thanks for coming. But I'm sorry I'm late to the game here at a, at a really early 6 a.m. meeting on Saturday, so that just ended. So hopping on this one. God bless. Thanks for showing up. Hey, so just, uh, just, um, just that I feel like a really rich convening of, of, of intelligence and insight right here. I've got, you know, a, a pretty decent outline made of the um, Metacare larger scale project proposal to go look for funding on the tune of, you know, half a million dollars or something like that. And, um, and now I've got most of the way of the first draft of a Metacare practice manual for anybody to kind of take home, just the outline. Um, but now we've also got this like very, very early prototypical you know, it's, it's the book Coherence, which is about looking inward at one's own health and emotional state and how that affects the world. Then it's the book Ecosonomics, which looks at how one has a relationship to self, other, collective, nature, and spirit, and how that relationship generates abundance through its explicit and coherent agreements. And then the third book is Reinventing Organizations, which invites us to take these internal self enrichment those relational dynamics and move it into systems so we've got like we've got layers of draft material here to put to work and i'm just i think it's hard even to say out loud like what it feels like here with like body failing Finances at the edge. Care, you know, I've spent yesterday from noon until almost seven, um, not right now, and, you know, without care until I finally called a friend and said, you know, I thought I was going to make this, but I really need somebody to bring me dinner. Can you help? So it's just like in the face of apparent absence in every way, something really beautiful seems to be growing. And uh, the thing that this gentleman last night left me with was, you know, the encouragement, like, why don't you listen to some of the Bible, you know? And so I, I said, what do you think? He said, how about Job? So I spent the last 24 minutes of my audio experience last night listening to the story of Job. And I'll just close with the, the piece that really hit me was Job's wife says to Job, you know, why don't you just you know, when his body is covered in wounds and says, why don't you just forsake God and die? Like, like, and I, that's exactly the experience 
that I have alone in bed with no answers and dire appearances. That's like in the darker moments, it's like, God, just surrender this fucking fantasy of love and just go into the darkness, you know? But, but I also know that allegory of Job, like, that, like there's, no, there's no distance in that. I can't run five millimeters in that because I'm just faced with like, nope, <laughs> love, metacare, the world in need, like there's something here. And so I'm just like, just stunned right now with all that's present. Yeah, that's me there. Thank you for that, Kabir. And I'm sorry you're in that place. And I hope we can find the way to turn that space, as you said, into the new hope. I asked the question to myself, like, this allegory of Job, like, what's this God, like, torturing Job to prove himself to Satan? You know, like, Satan just shows up and says, hey, like, I know, let's fuck with somebody you like, and God's like, yeah, sure, fuck with him. Like, what's the point of that? Like, what's God trying to prove to Satan? And what I realize is we have to love evil. God is holding an opening in his heart for Satan to find salvation, that which is unredeemable. God says, yes, go and test love, Satan. Go discover love that you, the unredeemable, may possibly be redeemed. And I think that's, I thank you for your sentiment, Eric, but I think like being in these places is important. There's a thousand things I know today that inform Medicare that I didn't know six months ago. Every one of them worth knowing and every one of them taking this to find. That's the work. And yeah. like, I look at all you here and like, what incredible support I have to find those things. Yeah, and for me, if I just coming back on, I, I deeply appreciate it, Kabir, and I feel like you're just re uh, uh, reigniting exactly the my what my gut was telling me of. There's just so much that you can give through your experience, even in this hardship of learning to love the devil, so to speak, um, and always holding that space. You know, there's a great deal that others can and should be learning from that, and and it's. It's got to be felt and experienced, and you, you know, you as a leader for that. So, thank you for that. Thanks, Kabir. Um, you know, I the last reading your blog post yesterday, I was, you know, I really felt your desperation and and yet you called Elisa and hopefully you got fed and but but I I'm with Eric I think this you're you're de you're demonstrating the urgency of the need for sharing this experience and with Le Bradford doing this uh, not coincidentally because there's absolutely no coincidences in your life um, you've got this opportunity to literally prototype Medicare. And, and you've got the materials, he's going to be, you know, and, and maybe it's patients or one of your other community members who might want to document the process as, as Le Bradford goes through his training. What, what's hard? What, what, what resonates for him? What what comes forward that is useful for other people to have up front? You know, how, how does he learn the Trello board? You know, and, and all the different things that are elements of your care. Um, 
the the stuff as well as the the environment and and his well-being and your well-being if if you can sort of capsulate that while you're going through it kind of have the camera rolling um it, it's that curriculum is going to just write itself and and you're going to have another member of your community to contribute from the point of view of i came in with the skills i had and the experience i had and he obviously has some rich experience and he's going to learn some things that then can be reflected back into the program so i think um now it's just a matter maybe of creating a new kind of of campaign to create more more bradford more la bradfords you know maybe look at how could the campaign be restructured to focus on bringing caregivers in for training um, because i think you've hit on something i think this is really um remarkable and i love the fact that somebody's gonna be living in your house so for a couple of months your safety is guaranteed and there's somebody physically there because I don't know about everybody else, but that worries me a lot. You're alone time. Me too. Freaks me out. <laughs> I'm scared. So, um, yeah, well said, uh, Tyler. Um, if uh, trying to move in, well, so first, Mike, you joined a little late. So, uh, if you saw the email, the short summary is uh, we're all, we're trying to find a way to basically build a space for flipping the logic of caregivers. Um, towards you know basically making this into an experience that people should be coming through but also recognizing coming to a key insight dennis was bringing up and and kabir of course as always because of medicare and how do we do this in a way such that the people are who are taking part are honored as full human beings with all the complexities of that meaning they have the financial and other types of assets and resources that allows them to be fully there and present and engaged um and so, so with that, if I may, I've been kind of playing around with this. Uh, I'm going to sh share my screen if, if I can get access to share screen. I've been kind of doodling on assets as we've been talking um, to just kind of play through this a little bit more on what assets can we have brought to bear. Oh, and Dion's joining. Nice. Good timing. Gang's all here. This is oh, one. Patience, you made Mike Carisu host. Oh, I'm sorry. Eric Cutler. Hardly the host here. I'm just trying to run a three ring circus with well, my family, with all of you here too. So sorry, Michael, now you're going to have that's okay. Eric the host. All right, hold on. Let's do this. Yeah, do this from on my screen, Eric is right under under you. Yeah, but I got a meeting set. I'm on my phone. So meeting settings. Dion, thanks for coming. Eric is about to share his screen and show some notes that he's been taking over the past uh, with everyone okay sorry i couldn't be here earlier it's all good. so the, the short summaries we're trying to um as the note i wrote kind of flip the logic of caregiving um and particularly now i'm so glad dion and mike you guys are on because one of the things before i get i share my screen as mike's figuring that out something i was i, I wanted to sort of plant in here and you'll see this from the dot from what i was just sort of doodling on is Dennis, it's exactly what you hit on. Caregiving right now is a marginalized uh, a profession. It, it, it doesn't, it shouldn't be. It's, it, it, it does not deserve that. I think it should be an elevated thing. But I, I, one of the ways I was consciously thinking about that is there, I'm wondering if this would be like one, one way to think about that is basically how do we link caregiving and this internship and this logic to Okay, now I am now the host, although Mike is now gone. So uh, that's so good. Hopefully he'll come back. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, the, the short summary is, is doctors do have a great deal of privilege and doctors do are elevated, right? What if, um, what if medical doctors, they get trained and they need to do their biochemistry and organic chemistry and anatomy and physiology what if uh, a key part of their training is not just doing clinical rounds, but it's actually taking a year of uh, an internship of doing deep care for people, you know, in the full lived experience of care. Um, uh -huh. you know, be fair. That's sort of where my head was going with this, because I feel like it, 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 that's sort of like a paradigm fire away. And so Dion, particularly as a, well, I was ho hoping to talk to both you and Mike as our medical doctors on the team, but just gut reaction to that. 
It's complicated. I mean, I love that. And I think um, there in, in the culture, you can often see an organic, um, I don't want to call it divergence necessarily, but a gravitation, I guess, <clears throat> for certain personality types and specialties to um, engage in that sort of more exalted caring function. Um, but it is, I would say, the minority um, for sure. And um, you, the, the sort of more elevated status of a physician doesn't happen until you like get to the last years of residency, really. Um, and during the first couple of part of years, and, and medical school is a, a weird sort of time where you're still um, considered, uh, you know, low on the totem pole, but you're like given the sort of student status that that garners oftentimes more um, esteem than first and second year residents. <laughs> so the culture, I mean, I love what you're saying and I wish it were true across the board that just having that status um, and the desire to engage were something that could be generalized about physicians, but it, it's not. And um, you are seeing, though, interestingly, the last several years, and I, I will send out some links if this seems interesting and relevant, um, but the, um, the more, uh, how to say this, wide appreciation for palliative care and as a specialty. And there's a couple of leaders in the field that I thought of instantly when you sent this note, Eric, about um, that are really trying to bring back the reverence as you describe and, and I agree with wholeheartedly. And there are many physicians, like even the most hardcore ICU doctors now that work with palliative care teams because they, when they discharge people from the ICU, um, you know, those are the folks that are trying to make decisions about care transition. And um, I have a couple of colleagues that uh, chose palliative care as specialties and they're phenomenal and they work with some of the leaders in the field. So I think perhaps that's a good model because um, what is now being recognized is the skills that palliative care doctors have, which I think are much more aligned with the whole value system of Medicare. Um, they're, they're unique among specialties, unfortunately, um, but that many physicians um, do actually value that and, and would love to engage in something the way that they may not take on palliative care as a specialty, but now they're much more widely um, respectful of, of what palliative care doctors actually do and realizing they could benefit um, within all of their specialties from interacting with those folks, learning from them, and incorporating some of, of those values and practices in whatever specialty they have. Thank you, Dion, for that. My two cents. No, and that makes a lot of sense. And I, and I knew, just to come back to your starting point, I knew what I was describing was not the norm, definitionally. But, but what you landed on was what I was, I was trying to figure out, which is my hunch is that there is some small place that we can wedge into. And I want, and it sounds like palliative care might be an interesting part of that. Um, another thing I was just thinking about is the movement towards patient centeredness and sort of saying like, if you really want to be patient centered, you need to like, and that maybe to bring back uh, the Bible into the conversation, right? Like you need to know, wash people's feet, you know, like even if you're Jesus, you need to learn how to wash somebody else's foot. Um, and that's an important part of this process. And that's like, if, and until you actually have had the lived experience coming back to this, not this isn't something you're going to rationally understand or learn through a book, but you need to feel what it means to care for someone in need uh, and live it for a while, you're, you're not going to be ready to do this work in a meaningful way. So that's just. Yeah, I, I mean, I love it. I agree. And I think many, many other types of specialties or personalities in medicine also, you know, feel strongly the same. And then many do not. They're, you know, they're genuinely, they don't, that's not how they view medicine or their role in medicine. And, um, and, you know, they, that's just going to always be the case probably. But I'm also wondering about, what's that? Forget the surgeons, forget the... You yeah, know, you know, it's fine, right? That's not who I'm talking to right now. Like, I, I, but the, the key is, is like, particularly being very pragmatic of Kabir has a uh, pressing need. It's sort of like coming back to the scholarship idea and whatnot. And now let me show my screen. And thank you for that, Dion. Um, 
I, what I was trying to think through is sort of recognizing the assets that we might want to just be mindful as we move forward. So I think scholarship is a really good one. It's a real concrete one. And I think just as I played through the numbers, $25 an hour, 24, seven cares uh, for 52 weeks, we're floating around $218,400 if we play that as our only asset, right? Um, so that, I just wanted us to see that and think about that. But then what I was started thinking about, particularly Kabir, as you were bringing up, you know, that you have, uh, I'm sorry, what was his name again? Who's now with you? Oh, Le Bradford. Le Bradford with you, right? Like, well, you do actually have a home, right? So you do have room and board. That is an asset to be to be mindful of, to allow uh, someone to live with dignity, right? There is you as a person and a being, which I think is important to think about. There is a training experience and then being enveloped in more of a collective experience, right? It's like not all, not people don't do everything just for the money, although they do need enough to live di with decency. And so I think it, it like, in my mind, part of the question is, is how do we build a context to allow people to live with decency? This in my mind is the number if you only think individualistic capitalist. I think we can, but I think there are other ways to get beyond this, which I do think also honors Medicare, but I, I, I invite us to all think about that. So then the last thing I started thinking about is, well, well then what are the assets that can be brought from the collective on this? So funding of scholarships, right, donations, uh, med students particularly thinking about requirements for training or anyone who is involved in the caring professions, right? Like, and that, this is, Dion, what I was trying to tee up with you, right? It's like, where would be a place where literally like tomorrow would be the ideal? Like we could say, yes, this is a, this is a requirement or this is something that you need to do, a nurse or something like that. And here's a place where you could go do it. Uh, in a very unique way. Like, I don't know if that's possible, but I just want to planting that in a sort of like, if we can build it into a training program, I think there's something real powerful there. Then of course, the, the other area could be potentially loans, but this, in my mind, the essential thing here, which patients, I think you were hitting at, this is really inspired from your point of like, when you learned how to feel and care, your, your, your work started to get better and you actually started doing well uh, for yourself and family too, right? So it's sort of like, loans, I think can work as long as it is truly an investment towards, you know, a stronger, you know, self and, and capacity to be part of the collective, right? And then, of course, there's parents and potentially taxes. These are parents good for taxes, probably not right now. But so I just wanted us to have mindfulness of this in terms of like, what are the assets we can br be brought to bear? And then knowing that we only have about 10 minutes left, I'd love to transition this back to practically knowing that there is that this is not an academic exercise, this is a very concrete exercise. Like, what do we think we, could be a very concrete set of next steps? I'm particularly looking back to you guys, Dennis and Tyler, who are more practical than me, as everyone knows. <laughs> what can we practically do to kind of um, start doing something for Kabir in this frame if, if, if we do think there is warrant value here? Um. Uh, well, Dennis may have some thoughts as well, I'm sure, but I, I do think documenting in some way um, the, the experience of the next two months in this intensive that's going to be happening is really important. Um, not only what training occurs, but how the training works, it, it, you know, what's hard from your point of view, Kabir, and his point of view. Um, What's, what did we think would be challenging that turns out to be a piece of cake, you know, all that stuff. If you can document this experience so that it can be mapped onto uh, a, a sort of step guide, you know, these are the things that have to happen up front um, to set the, the, the expectations. These are, this is my contribution to to the trainee, this is the trainee's contribution to the care field. Um, and and if, if that can be mapped out, and if we could start looking at how to characterize this into a different kind of campaign, so that instead of raising money for Kabir in the abstract, we're raising money to fund the training of these internships. Um, because it's a different listening that your audience is going to have, even though, you know, it's the same money. It has nothing, you know, but, but, and it's flowing through you and it allows you to pay for your care, but, um, and the room and board of your participants, if that's part of the project, which not coincidentally pays your mortgage. So, it, you know, how, how can the, the campaign be recharacterized or just start a new campaign? around this um, because it's very concrete. 
And, um, and I love that you're starting him off with this three different kinds of educational tools because, and, and that part of the process is you're going to dialogue about those. I think that's using resources and, and that's going to be really fascinating to see what comes out of that. Um, so, but, but that's what I think is the most concrete thing that we can do is start creating this step-by-step -step manual with real lived experiences and, and then re retooling the campaign. I throw in one, I think that was brilliant. One more is testimonials too, from people who have uh, worked with Kabir in the past. Absolutely. I was particularly saw it on the website, it's already there. It's just like putting it into that, like this is what I get from this, right? Um, and this is what it's like to be with Kabir, you know, like that's, I think is a key part of this. But yeah, other than that and everything else you said, plus one. 100%. Yeah, no, thanks. I agree. Um, I also thought it was brilliant and helps um, identify if, if I'm understanding the principles. I mean, there is a, a whole ecosystem in this, right? Not to overuse that word, but I think that helps identify um, how various aspects could also be more widely distributed if there were, um, you know, it's as Eric showed, I mean, and you well know there's so much to do and maybe there's an opportunity for more people to be involved with pieces of that um, where you know it would be a very concrete um, need that could be filled they could feel like they were part of the ecosystem um, and then you know i mean i think that's even more powerful sometimes is a, a a bigger community of people aligned for a similar goal To speak to the immediate practical, uh, Kabir, I think you should rewrite your ad and begin using the terms uh, scholarship and internship immediately. That's something you can do. Your ads are magnificent. I've seen them. And uh, share this list of uh, readings because that's a magnet for the kinds of minds you want to attract, coherence, ecosonomics, reinventing organizations. And be thinking too, um, not on, be thinking about the kids who are stuck graduating from high school with a target, and now they're stuck. They're they're in an unintentional gap here. Look to to hit those kids who might be thinking about pre med or pre nursing or just trying to explore a vocation. Have that feeling in them they don't know about yet. But this is a true service to to help a young person see if their vocation is really in this place. For some, it won't be. It's not for some, it's the light. And these are things that can be done, I mean, today, as soon as possible, to, to write that ad in a way that tr uses the trigger words we're talking about. It makes them real. So that's that, and brother, you're in a crucible. That's the word. I, I wanted to add, oh, sorry, Dennis. I, I want to add one thought to what Dennis just said, which is, just like um, City College has a nursing training program. The students that go to that program are, are, are some of the most diverse and challenged economically of students you'll ever meet. Um, and they're in their nursing program and it's a very well respected nursing program. So it may be worthwhile to reach out to them while students are on hiatus or looking for a way to afford to continue to go to school or looking for a place to live. So that's a community that you can reach out to um, that might be rich with potential um, people who might really value, they're already thinking about being in a care profession. Um, they might be really open to this training and their needs may balance out with your needs. So it's just an, a community to tap into, it's just a thought. And that's what's amazing about this wanna, group is there's so many resources. Everybody has their hands in so many things. Yeah, so I wanna add my thoughts here. And I know we're going over a little over time and I joined late, so sorry guys. I, and then and I, I, had to be the I had to be the sacrificial lamb to get off the call so Eric, you could share screen, I'm back on now. Um, so one, I completely agree, Eric. I, I, I've been reading all these emails. I just haven't had the, the time to respond this past week. Completely agree. It's all about the lived experience. And I think maybe, Dion, you touched on this a little bit. As a med student, first two years, you're just in the classroom. You're just learning. 
what it's like to be OBGYN, what it's like to be a family doctor, what it's like to be a pediatrician. You don't really understand what it's like to be OBGYN until you deliver your first baby, right? You don't understand what it's like to be a pediatrician until you're there by the bedside and your first child you're caring for dies. So it's the lived experience that you know makes or breaks this this decision of what you want to be the rest of your life in medical school. And so I completely agree that it's the lived experience of like being a caregiver. You could read all you want about it, but you're not going to experience it until you go there. So the way I'm putting on my academic hat here, but the way to look at this that I'm looking at it is like you know Kabir's experience is kind of like a clinical rotation you know i'll send the med students there and if you have that documentation I already have like what medicare is so i could pitch that to med schools for students who are looking for some sort of different type of an elective i just need like what are they going to be doing on the rotation and so that's what tyler what you're talking about is like you know you're this is the start of writing the curriculum of what medicare is like what's the day-to-day -day thing day one is orientation day two you know show up at this meet this, this caregiver and learn this, shadow this person over here. And so I think that you already have some of that content and it can be easily translated over. And some of the, like exactly what Dennis said, the ads that you have on Craigslist, I think could easily be translated into, all right, here's the objectives for, you know, the six weeks you're going to spend here in boot camp or whatever time period that, you know, comes about that. And I, I love the idea, Eric, of what you're using is like different forms of capital of like, hey, you know, you, you're a high school student, you're looking for an experience. Well, here's a, you know, kind of six week boot camp into caregiving. And here's what you're going to learn. Here's the objectives. And here's the deliverables that you're going to have during that time period. So I, I do think all the pieces are there. And, you know, it's just the vernacular that we're using to, you know, pull it together. And I love the idea that Tyler says of using that nursing students because, you know, tapping into the resources that are already here in town. I think, you know, this is exactly what we needed and um i'm sorry kabir you have to, to suffer to, to to get to push this in the right direction so quickly but sometimes you know un under pressure cookers things things are made faster it accelerates the speed of, speed of delivery yeah i, I want to just add right on to that around um uh I have been hearing, of course, a lot of a lot of people out of work in various capacities, and I, I just think there's a, a job repurposing that can be done um, in a way that is so beneficial. Um, you know, people thinking they're only qualified for um, certain things when indeed they have a whole bunch of skills that haven't probably even been, been valued in their previous position that they, um, you know, would be a fantastic fit. So I'd love to see. Um, kind of, you know, understand more about what the needs are and then do some thinking around, um, you know, absolutely, I think certain medical students would be interested. I think certain um, nursing, but also many other types of care professionals and then many other types of people who would never have thought they'd be qualified to do something like this. And if I can just build on the last and then we should get to next steps is the uh, just coming, I, this room and board one's really starting to get stuck with me of like, what if this was like, like we had a few different layers. We had the two month variation, but we also had this sort of year ro rotation where we have students. Share, that are in those same quickly meds. share your screen again so I can see that the vision. Oh, yeah. Here. About, the, about the room and board. I just want to see the spreadsheet as you're talking. Yeah, so this is what I'd come up with. Like, this is basically how much it would cost if we only had, if we only thought about the asset of money, um, as we thought about a living wage being $25 an hour, 24 seven, then that's just one person basically. But the non-financial assets are these. And of course, Kabir, you have a whole uh, multi-capital framework. So we should be thinking about that, right? So just putting that back out as I know you know, but we don't have time to go there. Um, um, but really just kind of, and this by the way, were the notes that I got in terms of next steps and whatnot, which I think feel exactly right. Right up the head, uh, start rewriting writing uh, towards scholarship and whatnot. But just this last one that I was trying to hit on in terms of room and board, I'm like, what if there, what if there are undergrads who basically, uh, they need a place to live, what if Kabir's house was the place to live, particularly to get the caring profession, right? So that becomes a key part of it where you're basically building a caring space for them to be a student, to be caring and to still go to SDC or otherwise, like something like that as a target was just another layer of this. And I could imagine a sort of writing up like this scholarship, but being very concrete, like this is supporting students such that they can really get deeply involved in what it means to truly care. Um, 
you know, and, and then hit all those different variations and then we can just start trying to recruit, you know, but. This is care, carer in residence. The care and residence program. There we go. Yes. That's a care and residence. <laughs> all right. So I, I think we are at that time, but what are, so it seems like we have next steps. What can, well, Kabir, I'd love to hear, uh, patients, what, what, what are you guys hearing? What can we help with? What makes sense for you to push forward on and otherwise, so. Well, I'm really glad that Patience has been taking notes. <laughs> Seriously, I've been watching and, 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 you know, I hear rewriting the ad. I hear targeting City College. I feel an adjustment in my awareness as I've been going through care.com and pinging people to see who would respond. I've been kind of looking at the age range of about 27 to about 50, um, but pushing that down um, into earlier places with more clear motivation and intention. Um, you know, starting to think about and determine and, and find ways to document the processes, process that's going on here as well. And yeah, yeah. And I'm also just to be transparent, I'm, I'm feeling the tension of being stuck in bed. You see, I'm keep trying to adjust this laptop and get it to play nice. And, um, you know, the The, the, I don't know what's the condition of the rest of the house right now. Um, I don't know what the condition of my care consistency is right now. As, like as yesterday, the agency called at 12.30 and said at one o'clock there won't be somebody. And um, yeah, I guess that's just maybe, that's maybe an emotional event but I, I think what we're, what I'm cognizant of is there's, there's linear momentum occurring right now, but it's also in turbulent space. And Eric, you said care, caregiving is undervalued, underappreciated. And what, what I think that's symptomatic of is, is you know, relative to what could be, not to what should have been. Um, care itself is undervalued as a common resource. We've, we've only just learning to value water and air, let alone care. And so I do think that, Dion, what you said about palliative care, as an example, and I was thinking in the back of my mind, also osteopathy, there are a couple of places in the field right now, and probably 10 more we haven't thought of offhand, where we can start to foreground, we can start to shift the pre-industrial model of medicine where we call it healthcare, but really we're training technicians, where we're, where we're actually starting to move towards what does healthcare look like in 50 years, where care is much more of a, an explicit part of the process all the way through the education of the practitioners and the participation of the community, et cetera. So I feel like I've got some marching orders and I just have to kind of wrap my heart and body and practicalities around meeting those commitments. Kabir, if there are things that we could offset, I don't know, if, well, I won't speak for others, but I, uh, I've got mental bandwidth again and, and I see the pathway and so I'm happy to be in that roll with you right now. So just, you know, sounding board, sending something to write or think through as a drafting and stuff. Just let me know. Yeah, I, um, like even, even the finances of the next two months are something that I really need to be out of bed to wrangle better. And so I've got some money in a business account I'm 
still trying to talk myself out of buying a laptop that's more powerful than this one. Sure. See if that'll aid the work in bed, but um, yeah, I mean, anybody that's got any time that wants to spend here with me, either on the phone or Zoom or in person, um, I just, like, I think Elisa's coming by today. Um, she found another business grant that I might be able to apply for. And so interesting, this context that's emerging right now. So she's going to help me kind of get through that process a little bit. And um, I am going to try and get up to my computer today and just depending on how much I can get done there, it's usually a pretty narrow window lately, but um, the, the Medicare manual, for example, is almost outlined and I would love anybody's eyes on that to push back and say, makes no sense or where's this or more of that or, you know, um, again, that's just one of those things that was, the karma of this has been insane since last November when every time I'm like literally a day or two away from something happening, like something just rolls through and I end up in the hospital or in bed or whatever, or the other caregiver quits or it's just, it's been remarkable. And so I'm just like, just letting that pulverize and open the part to me that still felt like I was doing any of this. Well, the reference to Job was not, was, was of course spot not, on. yeah, it was, it was truly spot on. Um, uh, but if you need eyes on any documentation, please, please, please just feel, send it to me. Um, you know, I'm good at that. Uh, and Eric is waving his hands too. So, you know, and yeah, I think all of us, you know, it, it are, are going to be able to help you with that. Um, and, and if you do want to reframe the campaign, you know, I can help on that and I'd be happy to. Yeah, I do. I do want to. I just like, Bandwidth. Bandwidth. We we all understand you're driving this bus, and and if but if you get stuck and you need us to push a little bit, you know, let us know. Thank you. Uh, patience. I want to speak to you directly because it just struck me that we built an asset during this meeting, and you've recorded it, and that recording is a powerful testimony to the spirit of what's going on here, and it should be in front of people who could fund this. So I, I don't know if, how others feel, but I'd be very comfortable with this Zoom meeting being shared with anyone who's willing to watch it, listen to it, and feel what happened here. Because we created something in this space around our brother in the crucible. You were burning. I understand that. It's your lived experience. It's so powerful to be near it. It's radiant. And the pain and the growth can feel it. Everyone in this, this space can feel it. And we have a recording now. We have, we have media. That's important. Great. Yeah, this is now uh, an archival document about uh, Medicare. So do we need a release, Kabir? Do you just speak it on to the recording? Yeah. I think Dennis just gave his release. I give mine. So it's every, I'm totally fine with, you know, sharing anything that we've, we've created here. I, I do think there's some great actionable next steps. But Kabir, you let us know how to help. Like, if, just just start whatever documents you have, just start sending them out. You know, and, yeah. And so we can I, all start in a shared document form. I think the other thing, just to put it out for each of us, like, I think each of us probably feels some variation of a calling. Like, I felt a calling of, like, when I called Kabir on Tuesday, and then I was like, I can't send this out because I don't know what the ask is, which is basically, I think, what started my heart into, I need to reframe this asset because uh, I know there's a need and I know there's value here, right? I I'm just wondering if we can each continue to sort of just allow our, our callings to be brought forth to each other, not to, just as I was saying, like, I, I, I didn't think I was right, but more of just like, well, at least it'll be something to be put into the crucible, if you will, to continue your uh, 
uh, thing, you know. So I just I, I just don't want to put it all on Kabir, basically, is what I'm saying. And so with that, Kabir, I, like I will, I'm going to continue to ponder, and if I have something, I will try to offer as best I can, knowing these to-do lists. I will share this Google Doc or that I just created too with everybody, so you can kind of see this kind of quick notes I took, even though patients, I'm sure you're doing it too. So, but yeah, always good to have different variations of the same thing. So yeah, I'd love your spreadsheet, please. And thank you all. We're, we're 10 minutes over. Elijah, do I'm last news it or? Yeah, his uh, Spanish class is done. I'm hearing him running around. So I, I best uh, get off as to the point, but uh, at least me, so, but. Good seeing you, Eric. Thank right. you, thanks. everyone. Yeah, thanks, Eric, for getting us started and moving forward so quickly. That I did just love having you involved for however much time you've got. It's great. Thanks. All right. As I said on my note, I, I really do find it nice affirming being with you all. And I wish I had more time to be with you all, truly. But that's for another conversation. And it doesn't have to be about me right now. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Thanks.